an autonomic nervous system. In short, we are going to see the head and controlling ganglion is hypothalamus. And it also gets the signal from the prefrontal cortex and the limbic lo uh, lobe, which plays a major role in controlling the emotions. Okay, during sympathetic, parasympathetic, suddenly Harisar is coming and tell you tomorrow is your FMG exam. Be prepared. How will be your emotional uh, effect? Oh my God, tomorrow is the exam. I have not studied even physiology. Okay, heart starts beating, increase heart rate, increase respiratory rate, palpitation, everything. How, why? Because the limbic lobe, which is responsible for emotions, it is giving the sensory signal to the autonomic nervous system to make the sympathetic parasympathetic workout. Okay, clear. And other vegetative functions during metabolic reactions, during after intake of food. So all those vegetative functions is also be giving the signal to the autonomic nervous system. So this is autonomic nervous system and the classification you all already know functionally, sympathetic, parasympathetic, entric, anatomically, sympathetic is from thoracolumbar, parasympathetic is from craniosacral. And the chemicals which is involved in this sympathetic, parasympathetic are mainly adrenergic, cholinergic or non-cholinergic, non-adrenergic. And that is what about the sympathetic, parasympathetic functions we have seen already and now the structure of spinal cord this is simple hand-drawn representation of the structure of spinal cord okay so we will just finish the spinal cord now uh, the structure of spinal cord you have the spinal cord is coming out through which foramen from the brain foramen magnum so from the medulla, whatever structure is coming into the foramen magnum will emerge out into the vertebral column as a spinal cord. So there you have an enlargement between C3 to C2, uh, T2 you call it as cervical enlargement. What is the length of the spinal cord? 45 centimeters. 45 centimeters. Okay, the last most part of the spinal cord you call it as conus medullaris and there you have another enlargement which you call it as lumbar enlargement through this you will get the brachial plexus lumbosacral plexus which is supplying the upper limb and here for the lower limbs so that makes you the enlargements in the spinal cord and what is the outer covering of the brain Protective covering of the brain. Outer covering of the brain. Scalp. Meninges. This meninges constitutes three layers, which is the innermost. Pia matter, which is close to the brain. It will also travel to the sulci and gyri, imaginations, everything with the brain. And next to the pia matter, you have arachnoid matter and the outermost dura matter, which is firmly attached to the skull. Okay. And next to the skull, you have the skull. Outer covering of the brain is meninges. Why are you telling skull? Okay, so this three constitutes the meningeal layers and since the spinal cord is also a part of nervous system, the spinal cord will also have the meningeal covering. Okay, clear. So here also you have the meningeal covering that extends up to the level of L5. Okay, so the pia matter, arachnoid matter and the dura matter. What is circulating in the subarachnoid space? CSF. So that is why, what is the specific location for lumbar puncture to get the CSF for laboratory investigations? Between L3 and L4, that is the place 
where you have the subarachnoid space and where you have the CSF. Okay, so that is the representation. And next to the meningeal layers, you have the outermost layer that you call as phylum terminale, which is the last part of the spinal cord. Okay, there you have all the nerve fibers. It looks like the tail of a horse. So it is called as phylum terminale. Okay, have you seen the gross view of the spinal cord? Yes, the gross view of the spinal cord. It will be just like the length of the bottle. It will be nearly 45 centimeters like one long scale is 30 centimeters and plus one 15 centimeters you have 45 centimeters. So in the tail part, if you just take a bunch of hairs, how it will be? As like that, you will have this phylum terminale. Only this, only this up to arm length, you will have the spinal cord. That is 45 centimeter, right? Okay. So that is the structural representation of the spinal cord. And now we will go into the spinal nerves and the tracts after the break. So we have seen the structures of spinal cord. And now we are going to see the spinal nerves, how it is going to enter and leave the spinal cord. So for that phenomenon, they have given a terminology, you call them as bell Magendi la. It was like one line traffic, like one way. So always, what is this bell Magendi law is telling you is always the sensory will enter through the dorsal root and the motor will leave through the ventral root. Okay, don't confuse yourself. Dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior. Dorsal and posterior is the same. Ventral and anterior is the same. Okay, so this is called as bell Magendi law. The Nerve roots of the spinal cord will travel like a one-way traffic signal. Okay, so that is why you call it as bell Magendi law. And specifically in respect to the tracks, the sensory tracks, motor tracks, where these tracks will come and make its synapse and then it travel either from periphery to the spinal cord or from spinal cord into the periphery. So you have specific regions in the spinal cord for all those sensory and motor tracts. So that is what you have shown in this picture, the uh, cross section of the spinal cord, which is showing you the picture. So you know that yellow color representation is the white column and the center gray color is the gray column, the gray matter of the spinal cord. The white matter you term as column according to the region dorsal white column lateral white column anterior white column and this is dorsal gray horn and lateral gray horn anterior gray horn on both the sides you have the same representation okay whatever the tracks i'm going to tell you and the nucleus i'm going to tell you it was there in both the sides okay and this is the midline for right and left representation. Posteriorly, that midline was given by the white column called as posterior median sulcus. And anteriorly, you have the depressed structure you called as anterior median fissure. Okay, so this and the, in the gray horn, you have the centrally, the central canal. This is the central canal of the spinal cord where the CSF is undergoing its circulation. Okay, clear? So this is what is the representation in the spinal cord. And this is with respect to the cells which are going to have its role in carrying the ascending tracts and the descending tracts of the spinal cord. So these cells which are present in the posterior region, they are involved in carrying sensory pathway or ascending pathway okay so those cells in the margin you have the marginal cells and next you have the sg substantia 
gelatinosa and next you have the chief sensory cells followed by clarkey column of cells okay just remember the location of these cells these cells are going to involve in specific sensory tracts okay clear and coming to the lateral gray horn you have only two neurons these cells in the sense they are the neurons where the synapse is going to take place from the nerve fiber which is coming to the spinal cord it will come and have its synapse with the specific cells whatever sensation it is carrying and coming to the lateral gray horn you have interlinear neuron and lateral horn cells the interlinear neuron is somewhat medial and the lateral horn cells as the name it is laterally towards the margin okay clear and next the anterior part you also term it as motor horn because dorsal is for sensory anterior is for motor so it carries the descending fibers from the cortex the fibers will come and synapse in these anterior horn neurons and then it will emerge out of the spinal cord to give the nerve fibers to the peripheral organs okay clear so that is anterior horn what is the specific virus which will give the defect lesion in the anterior horn of the spinal cord which results in paralysis one of the viral infection <coughs> causes atrophy of the muscles paralyzed especially in the appendicular uh, arms the upper limbs or in the lower limbs polio virus which have its significant lesion effect is seen in the anterior horn of the spinal cord so that is why the motor nerve fibers will not go and reach the specific region if it is for example lower limbs the nerve fibers carrying sensation in the lower limb that no anterior horn neuron has been affected then the lower limbs muscle will become atrophied because once when there is loss of nerve fiber for a chronic <coughs> period of time the muscle will become atrophied and no movement will be performed by the specific part of the limb okay so that is why the anterior horn cells you term it as motor neurons okay clear so this is alpha motor neuron rentsha cell and gamma motor neuron so now moving on to the tracts we have seen the nucleus and now we are going to see the tracts how it is organized in the spinal cord this is very 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 dry but you have to remember by repeatedly seeing these two pictures if you keep on seeing these two pictures then you will remember easily but if you sit and study one day and you thinking that you want to remember in one day it will be a very tough concept okay this will come into your mind and remembrance on repeatedly revising these pictorial representation visual memory will help you in this okay if possible try to take a print out and stick it in your room where you are seeing always okay clear so this representation this side is giving you the descending tracks ascending tracks but don't think that ascending tract is in one side descending is in one side for easy understanding it was mentioned but you have the things in both the sides okay clear so first in the ascending you have the content called as fasciculus gracilis fasciculus fasciculus cuneatus fasciculus gracilis is close to the midline on both the sides you have fasciculus gracilis for representation only one side is given in this picture think that it is present bilaterally remember that always okay fasciculus gracilis fasciculus cuneatus okay and then next you have fasciculus dorsalis okay don't consider that fasciculus dorsalis just remember this two only those pathways we are going to see of major concentration and then next consider the among the ascending tracts the spinothalamic tract 
anterior spinothalamic tract and also you have the lateral spinothalamic tract this is for, this is the place where you have the lateral spinothalamic tract so in the spinothalamic tract you have anterior and lateral okay and this is according to the spinocerebellar tracts spinocerebellar ascending always starts with the spino and ends with the place where the tract is going if it is dorsal column pathway in the sense it is starting from the spinal cord except this dorsal column pathway this is dorsal column it starts from the spinal cord and it ends at the somato sensory cortex one okay and this spinothalamic tract it starts from the spinal cord and it gives us a relay to the thalamus spinothalamic tract the spinocerebellar tracts you have dorsal ventral and lateral okay this three will start in the spinal cord and end with the cerebellum okay and spino olivary spinotectal where the spinotectal will give its relay midbrain tectum of the midbrain and this is to the olivary nucleus okay where is the olivary nucleus in the brain stem where you will have the olivary nucleus midbrain pons medulla where olivary nucleus pons where the cranial nerve emerges winding around the olivary nucleus okay clear so this is regarding the ascending tracts and now moving on to the descending tracts ascending tracts is going to come into the spinal cord through the dorsal horn and if it is the dorsal column it will travel via this way if it is the lateral horn it will travel via this way and some will cross the midline and go like this okay and now regarding the descending tracts descending tracts is the one as the name it descends from the higher center to the lower peripheral organs so the tract will travel like this okay it will come and come out of the spinal cord through the anterior horn okay so in the descending tracts the most important which one we are going to see is the corticospinal tract okay so corticospinal tract plays a major role in the descending tract it is also called as pyramidal tract okay so the corticospinal tract will come from the spinal cord and then it will pass via the specific region and then it comes out through the anterior horn cell so that is why it is called as corticospinal from the cortex to the spinal cord then it is leaving the spinal cord to the periphery and rubrospinal from the midbrain and then reticulospinal tract from the reticular activating system to the spinal cord mainly this reticular activating system is having a major role in sleep the process of maintenance of sleep rem sleep nrem sleep okay the reticular activating system and from vestibular apparatus to the spinal cord vestibular apparatus it is the one involved in the maintenance of equilibrium balance along with the cerebellum this is also involved with the maintenance of balance and equilibrium for this you want the vestibular apparatus to be in its normal form since it is related with the balance you should also have the relation with the spinal cord to supply the peripheral nerves and then tectospinal again from the tectum to the spinal cord in the corticospinal tract you have anterior and lateral corticospinal tract both will be considered as pyramidal tracts okay other than these corticospinal tracts the other than that you will term it as extra pyramidal tracts why it is called as pyramidal tract is because 
when it is coming out from the cortex it will travel at the central bulged portion of the medulla which you call as pyramid okay we will see all those things later so that is what is about the spinal cord tracts localization